Hi, I'm Jim Kellum with the St. Vincent Department of Biology. I had the wonderful opportunity to collaborate with Andrew Julo, director of the Verasco Center for the Arts at St. Vincent College and curator of St. Vincent's Arts and Heritage Collections. He and I, along with Dr. Michelle Duenas, also of the biology department, chose several works from the college collection that would highlight the intersections of art and science and nature in an exhibit called Flora and Fauna. It was featured in the gallery from February 11th to March 12th, 2021. This video covers the artworks that we chose in which the subjects were birds. I hope you enjoy these pieces as well as my narratives that explore the artistic and scientific choices made by the producers of each work. Audubon is best known for painting birds placed within their natural habitat and in realistic poses. Others of his time simply painted a bird without any environmental or behavioral context. In this print, one can see the sage grouse female on the left and the male on the right in grassy, rocky mountain steppe habitat where the species can still be found today. Audubon has drawn the male in a display posture in which decorative tail feathers are spread and the yellow vocal sacs are prominent. Males strut around with feathers erect while they pass air through their paired vocal sacs to produce a sound like gurgling water. If a female is so inclined, she will mate with him at the end of his display. Now two things strike me about how Audubon has drawn this pair. First, the male is shown in a very submissive pose. Would this have caused intrigue among Audubon's contemporaries? Naturalists at that time viewed males as combative and strong, and here it appears the male is begging for attention. But Audubon got it right. In this species, females are particularly picky. Males form leks of more than a dozen individuals, and they all display at once, allowing a female to choose the best one. For this reason, I am surprised that Audubon did not draw multiple males courting this female. Perhaps he wanted to portray a more intimate scene. Audubon, like most painters and naturalists of his century, used dead birds as models. Most of the birds he painted he shot himself, while others were obtained from hunters. I have no doubt these red-headed woodpeckers were painted in death like the others, but it is clear that Audubon knew this species very well from life, too. Evidence for this includes the bird's omnivorous diet. Here you can see one parent delivering a nut to one brown and white fledgling, while a second parent delivers an insect to the other fledgling. Nuts and insects are common diet items for adults of this species, but hard nuts would not be given to a bird so young. Nevertheless, this is Audubon's only mistake. Woodpeckers create nests by excavating a hollow inside a tree limb or trunk. Audubon shows a third young bird peeking out from the entrance of such a nest, and since all young leave the nest on the same day, Audubon has drawn us this merry scene of fledging day. That third baby will soon join its siblings on the outside of the tree. Baby birds are fully grown when they leave their nest, so it is not unusual that all the birds here are of similar size. There is one last detail that tells us that Audubon knows these woodpeckers well. Looking at the broken tree trunk, there is a hollow part where the two fledglings are perched that was probably the parent's nest in a previous year. It is common for a woodpecker nest to weaken a tree trunk over time, and the trunk can break at the weak spot during a windstorm. In this image, Audubon is not only showing happy parents with three hungry offspring in the present, he is also giving us a window into the past where these same adults raised a previous brood. The Kessel, now known as Quetzal with a Z, is a famous bird that lives in the tropical montane forests of Central America. The species pictured here, the resplendent Quetzal, is the national bird of Guatemala. I presume, however, that Brahms' work was the first introduction to this bird for his readers. 
This illustration alone helps teach something about the bird's natural history. The first thing of note is the long tail feathers, a feature for which the species is named. Quetzali means long tail feathers in Nahuatl, a native language in Mexico. Similar to a peacock, tail feathers like this are not useful for flight and instead are for display purposes only. And only males possess the long tail feathers, which means two males are depicted in this work. In real life, two males would never come this close to one another. Perhaps the painter was simply showing the front and back side plumage by drawing two individuals in different positions. In the background are a variety of plants. A big cat that I cannot identify, and it may not be a realistic representation of any particular species, and also a groundhog-sized rodent, called an aguati. While paintings of other birds elsewhere in Brehm's book also feature native plants and animals in the background, the placement of these quetzals physically above the other animals may be an intentional decision, reinforcing the fact that the quetzal is viewed as a representative of the Aztec creation deity Quetzalcoatl, a feathered serpent who created the boundary between earth and sky. Buffon's encyclopedic work spans 36 volumes on birds, mammals, reptiles, fish, and minerals of the earth. He did not travel outside of Europe, so his project relied on specimens sent to him. It is curious that in this depiction of male and female birds, labeled number one and two respectively, from Mozambique, that he is showing them billing. They are touching bills together in courtship, like a kiss. Such behavior is documented in relatively few species around the world, but it is not rare in those species that do it. Adult birds also feed one another in courtship, so maybe this is the behavior that Buffon meant to highlight. In either case, how did Buffon know that this species would engage in such behavior? My guess is that he didn't. I cannot identify the species shown here. Buffon's title, Der Siefig von Mozambique is translated as the Siskin of Mozambique. Siskins are small seed-eating birds and members of the finch family. In the accompanying text, there is also reference to the canary, Canary Vogel. Canaries are also members of the finch family, so Buffon was on the right track. A modern list of Mozambique's birds include eight finches, some of which are true canaries. Even in Buffon's time, people kept canaries as pets, so he may have observed billing behavior in a captive species and assumed that a wild bird with a similar name would exhibit it, too. But even if a siskin and a canary are in the same family, they will differ not only in body shape and plumage, but behavior, too. The naming of species is important for this reason. I find it ironic that Buffon was a contemporary of Carl Linnaeus, the father of modern taxonomy. Linnaeus developed the binomial nomenclature, or two-word naming system, that scientists use today. Alas, Buffon was known as a critic of Linnaeus' system, one of relatively few errors in judgment Buffon made in his 36 volumes. Unlike most of the other artists in this exhibit, Dreindl has placed these birds side by side with little hint of their natural history or behavior. The arrangement reminds me of our modern field guides in which bird drawings are presented mostly for the user to compare to what they have seen in the wild. So you saw a vulture, I say. Did it have red and fleshy skin on its head like the bird pictured in the bottom left? Or was its head covered with a fine layer of downy feathers like the bird next to it? Did it, did it have a black beak or some other color? Were the legs obscured by feathers, or were they completely bare? Trying to identify a bird seen in the field for only a couple seconds is a lot harder than it seems. I tell my students it's a lot like the problem police detectives have when witnesses to a crime try to describe the perpetrator. What was the thief wearing? Witnesses often disagree. Even in the field guides of today, the bird pictures are like mug shots. A picture rarely looks like the real thing because the lighting is poor in the field or the position of the live bird is different than in the book. Drendel's work from the 1850s is fairly good considering the technology of the day. 
However, almost all the birds shown here contain some degree of blue coloration, and yet none of these raptors should be blue. I think the bluish shade is supposed to represent gray feathers or gray skin. For example, the bird at the bottom left corner of the right page is clearly a secretary bird, a four-foot-tall vulture relative in Africa that runs more than it flies, hence the long legs. However, the top surface of a secretary's bird's wings are a light gray color and not blue in any way. Baird was a famous ornithologist of the 19th century, born in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. If his artistry is reminiscent of another famous ornithologist named Audubon, there is good reason. Baird and Audubon exchanged letters, artwork, and preserved bird specimens. The two men also employed the same artists and lithographers to produce copies of their respective works. The three birds shown here are, number one, rose-throated Beccard, number two, gray-collared Beccard, and three, the dusky-capped flycatcher. These are songbirds that perch in trees of forests and open spaces to capture flying insects, beetles, and caterpillars. Every bird has a beak and head shaped for the food it eats. Examining these birds, one can see the small hook at the end of the upper bill. Like that of an eagle, this hook would help the becard or flycatcher tear apart larger prey like bees and moths. The tiny hooks are a small detail that others might miss, but not Baird. He also included the fine feathers at the base of the beak. Scientists believe these function like mammal whiskers, giving the bird a tactile information about where its beak is in relation to its food. With the widely spaced position of the eyes on the head, most birds cannot see items at the front of their beaks. Baird drew all three birds from the collected specimens sent to him from the southern U.S. border in the 1850s. If a similar effort were made today, the gray-collared Beccard would not be featured. It is now an uncommon bird and its geographic range has shifted south by 100 miles. It is not known why. At least two of these birds may be familiar to you, since they live in Pennsylvania. They are the European starling in the top left, and the brown-headed cowbird on the top right. From afar, both just appear to be blackbirds without much ornamentation, and yet, upon close inspection, they have varied an iridescent plumage that Oaken has been able to reproduce with merit. When I teach my ornithology students about these birds, I point out that not only are they pretty to look at, they also have beauty in their voices. The starling is especially talented and can mimic other species' calls. The common mina, which is in the top center, is even better known for its vocal mimicry. Like the songs of these first three birds, there are amazing things about the others that cannot be shown by a two-dimensional drawing. The two birds in the middle left of the plate are the scarlet-rumped casic and a village weaver. The weaver, which lives in Africa, is named for the elaborate, spherical nests that it weaves from grass. The casic lives in South America and builds similarly remarkable nests. The bird with the long tail in the middle right is a lesser bird of paradise, known for its courtship dances. The blue bird below it in the bottom right is called a European roller, named for its courtship display that includes the bird rolling side to side in mid-air while diving at fantastic speed toward the ground. Finally, in the bottom left is the South Island Kokoko of New Zealand. The beauty of this bird is in its disability of not being able to fly far distances due to its short wings. It moves gracefully by leaping from perch to perch, browsing on vegetation and invertebrates low to the ground. From all this, one can see that the majesty of birds is not only in their colors, but in all aspects of their being. Such splendor must not be taken for granted. The Kokoko is essentially extinct, having been seen just once since 1967.